Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our final installment of the 2024 Covey Lecture Series. I'm Debbie Ingalls. I'm the director of Covey here at Brock University. Our speaker today is Dr. Jim Wilwer. Uh, Jim is an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences, but he has a long affiliation with us in Covey as he was the Institute's first senior scientist in viticulture uh, that started uh, quite few years back, I believe 20 years in that time now. So after a decade of working with Covey and implementing the award-winning Vine Alert program alongside Dr. Kevin Kerr and, and myself, Jim competed for and was successful in attaining an assistant uh, professor position in plant physiology in our biology department. And this has enabled him to continue with his Great Mind Cold Hardiness uh, research program. So Jim's research is focused on understanding how to maximize cold hardiness for Vitis vinifera with direct application of his results out to the great growing uh, uh, community. This work has led to more fundamental research uh, utilizing plant growth regulators to promote hardiness and understanding woody plant cold hardiness physiology for crops beyond just grape. In addition to this work, he runs a great varietal evaluation program to understand how Vitis genotypes can impact hardiness, wine performance, and wine quality. And this is a program that will be expanded uh, quite uh, extensively with the recent announcement of the $9 million um, infrastructure grant uh, that Jim led along with Siv Pujari. Uh, and Jim's component here will be instrumental in setting up a, a research vineyard uh, for us um, uh, just up the road, along with uh, some other infrastructure investments that will be made uh, with that fund. Long-term goals of uh, Jim's research programs are to improve the sustainability of the grape and wine sector by optimizing vine selection and improving resiliency um, to a changing climate. He has a decade of experience with effective technology transfer to the great grower community. He is the past chair of the American Society of Enology and Viticulture Eastern section, and he sits on several Ontario grape and wine industry committees. So please join me in welcoming Jim for his lecture today in understanding Vitis vinifera in Ontario after a decade of monitoring. Thank you very much, Debbie, and congratulations on another successful Covey Lecture series this year, and to you, Greg, as well, for all the hard work that goes into this. So I guess I'm rounding things off for the year, and Debbie told a little bit of a story about myself, and I'm going to talk about this little bit of story about research and about cold hardiness and what we've done here at Covey, uh, what we've learned over the last more than a decade, but I'm going to talk about specifically about 10 years of research uh, based on uh, some, some recent uh, analyses that we've worked on preparing um, a manuscript and also uh, Dr. Uh, Andrian Haber Hache's uh, PhD dissertation. So I will talk about things that we're, we've done, uh, what we're doing, and what we're going to be doing moving forward. So before I start though, this is a decade of work and, and when you're part of Covey, you're part of a, a, a big team that's all got similar goals. And so I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Ingalls, Dr. Kerr, Ryan Brewster for all of the development and support of Vine Alert, as well as supporting with data collection. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Andrian Haber Hache, who's a former PhD student of Debbie and ours, or Debbie mine, I should say. Um, she has uh, put a lot of work into some of the, uh, the slides that I'm going to present, or at least some of the data that I'm gonna present within these slides, as well as uh, Alex, who's here, uh, uh, Stephanie Billick, Mary Jasinski, and all the other students as well who have helped collect all of this data uh, for our lab group. So as you're all aware, I mean, this is something that unfortunately we've been dealing with across Canada in all of our regions within the last five years. Uh, freeze injury is a, is a great threat to not only grape but also tender fruit production throughout North America and in the world. And since 2010, as Debbie mentioned, you know, Covey and Brock have really been leaders when it comes to grapevine cold hardiness uh, and offering uh, a lot of applied research, outreach, and service initiatives to assist the industry to mitigate freeze injury and crop loss related to cold temperatures. 
And so I want to talk a little bit more about what we're doing and, and, and talk a bit more about, you know, what we've learned over the years. And, you know, when it comes to mitigating freeze injury, you know, it's, it, this is a really important thing when you're trying to grow a, a, a tender uh, uh, crop like grapevines or apricots, peaches, and so on and so forth. And so many of our cool climate regions can be susceptible to freeze injury. And I just want to get the notion off the table that, you know, climate change is going to eliminate freeze injury in our cool climate regions. It's probably going to get worse, actually, unfortunately. And I truly believe that's like we're going to be struggling with this for a long time. And I'll talk a little bit more about the reasons why I say that. And cool tolerance is generally the limiting, or it is the limiting factor for growing grapes or a cultivar within a given region or site. And with climate change, you know, I think we've had a shift to a lot of people focusing on the growing season only and pushing the limit. But oh, it's getting warmer in our growing seasons. Let's grow these varieties because it matches the growing season better, forgetting about the winter months. And I think uh, we've seen some of that uh, in some of our regions uh, in Canada and elsewhere. So when we're looking at cold hardiness and why we were doing this work, you know, at Covey over all, the, all these years is, you know, to have an effective freeze injury uh, mitigation strategy, uh, you need to know how cold tolerant the vines are and the growers do specifically. And that's why, and the reasons why is because, you know, cold tolerance is going to change throughout dormancy. And I'm gonna talk more about that today. It's a very complex trait, and there are a number of different factors that come to play here. And it is influenced by both the variety, and so the genetics, as well as the, the environmental conditions. And we've learned even clone and rootstock can have impacts. And it's highly dynamic, so it's changing a lot based on uh, temperatures and so on. So we do grow a lot of different varieties in our cool climate regions. Like we think about Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, for example, but we're growing a lot more than that. And we're also growing a lot of hybrids. Uh, there's a lot of different clones, and we are also using a number of different rootstocks, depending on the type of soils that we're in and the water demands that, uh, that the plant may need. And uh, when we look at vinifera and hybrids and, and all the other genotypes, they all are going to have some unique responses. And so, again, I'm going to talk more about that today. And so when you're looking at what a variety should, like why it will do well or not, you know, it has, to, it has a lot to do with the conditions that they're under. So the growing season and fall conditions can have an impact, particularly on cold acclimation. Uh, there's an impact on maximum hardiness that's really controlled by the genetics of the, of the plant. And then there's also various uh, aspects that can lead to deacclimation. And one of the problems is lack of resistance to deacclimation, particularly if we have a warm winter, uh, a period of winter where it's, there's a lot of volatility and so on. So what does this all mean ultimately? The environmental conditions can have an, a profound impact on the hardiness. Cultivars are going to respond differently. Traditionally, we've always only looked at maximum hardiness. You know, and when, you, when you were looking at what vines you should plant in the ground, it was basically like, well, this one's more hardy than this one. Uh, and you're looking strictly at midwinter temperatures. But we now know that that's not necessarily the case. And particularly if we have a change in climate where we're getting, you know, really strange weather in the fall or in the spring, late winter, you know, that suitability of that cultivar may change because of the way it responds uh, to those uh, conditions. So cultivar suitability is really dynamic. So I'm going to start now talking a little bit about the story and, and more about uh, why we were doing what we were doing and with respect to collecting all of this hardiness information. So as I mentioned, to have proper freeze mitigation strategies, uh, we need to uh, be uh, efficiently, or, yeah, to, to use these properly and efficiently. Uh, it's critical that we have both timely and reliable information on hardiness. And that's for if we're using wind machines, even something like geotextiles or vine burial, uh, to understand when to use these, when to stop using these, and so on and so forth. So in 2010, we developed Vine Alert. And this program was a risk, risk mitigation uh, program where we collected and monitored hardiness information and alerted the industry at periods of risk. So as a whole, this program has collected over 10 years of hardiness data. So we have a huge data set, and that's because we have 
over 10 years of data, actually 13 years of data, or 14 years of data actually, I think, up to eight cultivars were, were uh, studied over three different appellations and then 10 sub-appellations within the Niagara region. And we also had replicated sites, vineyard sites that were used in each one of these sampling regions. So we had a range of cultivars and we had this diverse site selection. You know, it's one of the things that makes Ontario really interesting is we have this diverse terroir. So we wanted to also be making sure that we were looking at these different regions uh, where these different varieties were grown. At the same time, there's a lot of also complementary research of looking at additional varieties, uh, looking at different clones and rootstocks and other experiments that were being done. So right now, I haven't had a chance to crunch the numbers. I was gonna ask Alex to see what was in the database, but then I have to still expand it. Anyways, we're probably close to a million buds probably that we've, that we've actually tested uh, over all the covey-related projects. So this is everything from you know, the, the vinyl art program to um, all of the different research trials, evaluation trials, and so on and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about some things that we've learned when we look at all of these data. Sorry for the small uh, uh, text on here, but I think that gives you appreciation of how much we've looked at. So these are looking at a number of different sites across the different appellations and a number of the different varieties. So you can see most of the varieties that we're looking at here are the core varieties that we were looking at with respect to the eight varieties. Uh, and at every single location, we were looking at Cabernet Franc and Chardonnay, which are uh, the two most widely planted uh, vinifera, uh, both white and red, uh, respectively. And in many of the cases, when we're looking at Chardonnay and Cabernet Franc, we've got over 10 years of data that we used uh, to analyze uh, uh, for, this, for this talk and for uh, some of the work that we've been doing. And then we also have a number of other varieties, such as Riesling Chardonnay, or sorry, Riesling Pinot Noir, and, uh, and some tender varieties, such as uh, Syrah, Merlot, and Sauvignon Blanc. And as I mentioned, we were looking at different appellations, so Niagara Peninsula, Lake Erie, North Shore, and Prince Edward County, as well as a number of different sub-appellations. So one of the things when you're thinking about uh, the site differences and why, why would we look at all these different regions is that, you know, when we're looking at site selections, a lot of our regions are grown close to, uh, or we're growing grapes close to a large body of water. Uh, and also that large body of water, you can, it, with, even within the Niagara Peninsula, for example, you can have more of a lakeshore site, uh, a lake plain site kind of in the middle or a bench site, or you can be on top of the escarpment. So that, that proximity to that large body of water can have an impact. We know this, you know, from the different sub-appellations why they were created. We also have different landforms, so you can have the escarpment like you see here, like this is a, a classic bench site uh, where we have the wall of the escarpment and that air can drain uh, as well. Uh, so it, it helps mitigate uh, freeze injury. But these types of things can also have an impact on actual cold hardiness because the temperatures in the spring, fall, and winter, remember I said that hardiness can be dynamic, those, can, those temperatures during those period of times can impact things like cold acclimation, maximum hardiness, as well as deacclimation. Secondly, the soils can have a big impact. There's a big soil difference between the lakeshore sites, the bench sites, and so on. And this can impact water drainage, which can impact uh, things like acclimation or deacclimation, as well as uh, vine vigor. And so when you look at these two factors, we, these can impact the growth, the, the fruit on the vine and the, and the yields, as well as the, the maturation of both the fruit and the vine. And that can ultimately also impact hardiness. So if we look at absolute, absolute minimum temperatures over 10 winters, and if we break it down, instead of having a ridiculous amount of points on there, and just breaking it down by just general area, you can see that, the, generally speaking, that the, the Prince Edward County here in the, in the purple, you know, it is the coldest appellation. And this has implications for what they do to protect their vines. They're burying vinifera vines using geotextiles uh, and so on, or they're growing uh, uh, very winter hardy hybrids. If you look at Lake Erie North Shore and you look at the other regions here within Niagara, and if we break it down from the bench and then looking closer to the lake uh, as well on top of the escarpment, you can see that it can vary from 
um, from region to region, but the big differences are year to year. Like we have a lot of fluctuation, you could see in the absolute minimal temperatures from one year to the next. And traditionally, if there was no mitigation strategies whatsoever, you would have winter damage, you know, in many of these years where this temperature drops down, you know, below, let's say negative 22. Let's just give it an arbitrary number like that. But that's why mitigation strategies in a, hard, in a hardness monitoring program were really, really important. Because this is the reality. And you could see, you know, this is, goes back to 2000, I think 2010 into 2020, for example, around that timeline. Um, you could see that it's not like we're just getting warmer and warmer winters. And again, that's where I'm saying just because we're having a change in climate doesn't mean we're going to have um, a linear uh, trend in terms of just warmer and warmer winters. It's the absolute temperatures are the ones that we really care about because this is when you get damage, right? You can have a, a mean that's going to be increasing, but if you still have these absolute temperatures, these absolute minimums, this is where the damage occurs. If we look specifically at the, uh, at within the, the, uh, the sub-appellations and just grouping them, you can see again, there, there can be some separation between some of the different, uh, different sites and the, the proximity to the lake and so on. And then this is where you get some spaghetti, but I do want to show you just again, why monitoring hardiness is important. It's not the same no matter where, you're, where you are. So this is why we were collecting data at so many sites. And you could see that in, if you look at the, all the gray, that gray spaghetti, that's the Niagara region. And that's looking at Chardonnay here, or sorry, Cabernet Franc on the left and Chardonnay on the right. And so there can be a, a big difference with respect to um, the, the degrees of hardiness and maximum hardiness, acclimation and so on, depending on where you're growing the grapes. Lake Erie North Shore, surprisingly, in, in many cases, it was a little bit more, uh, the vines got a little bit more winter hardy there um, compared to some of the other regions, uh, and that's highlighted there in the, uh, in the red. Now, the Great Lakes are going to have a big effect, and that's something when you look at climate models and so on, I don't think they're being taken in consideration because you're looking at things happening at the macro climate, but at the mesoclimate level, we're not getting, and I don't have a slide on this, but like we're not getting uh, ice cover as much on the lakes. So that's going to have an impact on midwinter temperatures. It's going to have impacts on the tail ends of the season, both spring and fall. And so that is going to come into play here when it, when it comes to our terroir, like uh, both for the uh, growing season as well as in the, in the winter. So some of these differences may actually change. Like Lake Erie typically would freeze. And we haven't had ice cover in a number of years on Lake Erie. So those, the maximum temperatures in Lake, in Lake Erie North Shore might not remain, you know, some of the more cold hardy uh, uh, or maximum hardiness values that they traditionally had because that lake's gonna be a bit warmer. So those vines may not acclimate as well. Don't know, but just to, in terms of just considerations here with respect to some of the implications of looking at these data and, and trying to uh, understand what the future is gonna look like because we have all this information. So this is a very, very simple slide, just to show you that we do have these different cultivars uh, of vinifera that can range quite a, a bit with respect to their cold tolerance. And so if you look at just one season, one site, uh, here's an example of, you know, we look at Chardonnay and Riesling here, and they acclimate uh, more readily, they have a, a more winter hardiness, and then they, they will deacclimate at generally similar rates to other varieties, uh, but Chardonnay is one that will deacclimate a little bit sooner. These varieties, Sauvignon Blanc and Merlot, are what we would consider more of a cool, tender uh, Vitis vinifera variety. They do not get as winter hardy, and as a result, and I'll show you a lot of data that's I think really, really cool, looking at cultivar differences, uh, they just don't acclimate as well. And, they can be, and because of that, they can be more uh, susceptible to freeze injury. So let's dive more into this. And if we look just at Merlot, look at the differences in, in, uh, in, all, in different years based on one specific site. And this goes back from, this goes to 2010 to 2020. And you can see that every single year is a bit different. 
It's kind of like, you know, as you talk to an agri grower and they're like, what's a normal year? Tell me what's a normal year, right? And so this is where it gets really challenging and why the more data you have, the better of, a, of an idea you, you, you'll, you'll have in terms of what, how these are going to perform, how are they going to perform in the future, what do we pick, right? What do we, what do we grow, right? And where do we grow these? And this is, I think, this is, I'm going, I'm going to start at, like I started kind of big, and I'm going to talk here about uh, winter uh, hardiness of uh, different cultivars that I, from ranging from the more hardy viniferas to the uh, tender viniferas at uh, many different locations and over many years. And the, the first section of the table here is LT10. So this is a temperature at which 10% of the buds are predicted to die uh, based on differential thermal analysis, 50% uh, and 90%. And if you look at the mean, you could see that we have differences based on these different cultivars, which we'd expect. But the ranges of these can also vary quite a bit from one year to the next. I mean, we could have an LT10 in Merlot of negative 12 all the way to negative 22. And, and so on. And so this is looking at, you know, the, how dynamic the hardiness can be for these different varieties and how you can kind of rank them based on their hardiness. But let's look a little bit deeper here. And if there's any questions, like as we're going along, please feel free to ask. Now, if we look at the range of, of, of uh, hardiness, this is where I, start, I think it really starts to get a little bit more interesting, and I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into this. And so this is looking at the general range of hardiness from the red dots being uh, LT10, LT50, and LT90, the blue. And this line here is the mean, uh, the monthly minimum temperature, the mean monthly minimum temperature in January over, that, over the period of those 10 years, from 2010 to 2019. And you could see that there is more risk of getting at least some freeze injury on these tender varieties. Merlot, Syrah, Sauvignon Blanc, and Cabernet Sauvignon. Cabernet Sauvignon is not really a variety we think of that winter tender, but part of the problem is it's a late maturing variety. And so this is probably explaining a little bit of what happens when Cab Sauvignon is getting picked in December. And which, we, we've, which we've done before, we do, we do it often actually. And you could see how big of a range of, of hardiness that this that Cab Sov can have between LT10 and LT90. Whereas if you look at our core varieties, and these are the varieties that, you know, VQA are really pushing, the GGO, uh, growers, wineries, right? It's, we have a core four or five if you include GMA. Well, look where these ones sit. All right, all right down below. None, there, most of the years, or uh, sorry, all the years of, the, of this 10 year data, you know, we, uh, if you look at the mean data, we're way beyond uh, that, that, that threshold where we're going to have damage. And you see that the, it's a lot tighter of a range between LT10 and LT90. And so this is looking again at a lot of data and there's going to be some sites that are going to be even better than others when it comes to having uh, maximum hardiness and having a smaller range between LT10 and LT90. Now, if we look even more closely, this is looking at the eight different cultivars and looking at maximum annual winter temperature. And again, if you look at the, at the LT10 or the LT50 or the LT90, look at, again, the variability in, in terms of the, the hardiness in a variety like Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc, or even Cab Sauvignon Syrah. Then you look at these varieties, whether it's LT10 or the LT50 or 90, and look how tightly they're clustered with respect to their hardiness and their, and their, and their uh, ability to gain cold tolerance. They're much better at, at this in, in terms of on a regional level and looking at all of these different sites where these varieties are grown. Then if we go even a little bit deeper, this is looking at within a site itself. And we can see if we just even look on the right hand side, if we look at just the variation in bud hardiness, you could see that the, the Sauvignon Blanc vines 
they have a much a, a much larger range of hardiness on on the vines themselves in that site compared to Riesling, where they're all a lot tightly clustered. So what some of the takeaway I want to make here is that if you look, you know, some of these Sauvignon Blanc buds can get as hardy as Riesling buds, but they're just it's just not as good, like in terms of not as efficient as getting more overall hardiness. And this is a frustrating thing as a researcher, because of why you know why is this happening? But then we're talking about a biological system here, right? And so there's this is these these are the type of data that we that we see is that it's not you're not going to just say this variety is this hardy at this time at the site. It can be very dynamic, and there can be a lot of variability in this, and and it cannot be ignored, you know, especially if we're looking at. Uh, modeling of hardiness data and so on and so forth. It is something that is um, is very very important. And when if you're one of the advocates, if you're one of, in the industry that are saying I'm only going to grow these varieties because I think this is what we should be growing, when you look at this data, it's kind of hard to argue that, right? Because they are going to be more consistent with how they're going to acclimate and to uh, uh, have the best chance of overwintering uh, well. However, at certain sites, you know, Sauvignon Blanc can be as hardy. And if you look back, you know, you look at some Sauvignon Blanc data and hey, some years maximum hardiness down negative 25. So it's not like it's impossible. And so if those vines are grown in the right conditions and it's the right site, right clone, right rootstock, it can be very successful. So this is also why I'm also supportive of new varieties and alternative varieties and so on, but not but I understand where the core comes from and I'm totally supportive of that because that makes the most sense for, for our, our core of our industry. Now, the other thing is looking at, that was looking at just general maximum hardiness. And now to talk a little bit about acclimation rates and deacclimation rates. So the variety, either the genotype as well as the environment can impact both acclimation and deacclimation. And through all of the Vine Alert research and, and myself, uh, uh, Kevin Kerr and others who have been involved have talked about the impact of growing season as well on hardiness. The growing season can certainly have an impact, particularly on acclimation. Um, and if we see a delay in fruit maturation, it's generally a delay in, in, um, in vine acclimation. And we could see how deacclimation can really vary here on just a snapshot from Vine Alert of looking at Chardonnay and, and at the Four Mile Creek location and how in a year like 2014-15, uh, a polar vortex year where there was a crazy amount of uh, lake ice, uh, it was very, very cold for a long period of time. Those vines got hardy, they stayed hardy and they deacclimated really slowly. And then if you look here at 2009-10, this was, or sorry, 11, 12, I should say, the, uh, the vines deacclimated uh, very quickly and we lost a lot of winter hardiness. So this particular winter, I was a little bit nervous in, in March, but when I look back, I'm like, we had temperatures of over 30 degrees or close to 30 degrees in March that year. We were just getting, you know, temperatures maybe high teens, low 20s here, and it wasn't for a long period of time, and then we had cold right after that. So this particular year, you know, we did not see this type of deacclimation, but it is certainly a concern um, in, in that respect. So these tables are, aren't perfect, but I wanna just show you a, a bit of a, a snapshot of some years looking at Chardonnay in terms of hardiness changes. So what these data show you are the, the rates of hardiness changes by day. And we're looking at each one of these different dots are different locations. And the scales of, this, of, of all of these aren't equal, but I want you to sh I want to show you that in some years, like a very cold year, like 13, 14, there was not as much change in, in variability in the hardiness, either from the, the time of the day, or sorry, the date or the location. But in some years where it was warmer, there was a, in, in more of an average year, like 12, 13, you could see there's a lot more bounce in the data and a lot more change happening. And the rates can be quite high. If you looked at 11, 12, 
we were seeing some sites and some and at some periods of time that were losing close to a degree a day. Um, and that's what we kind of, that's what we found uh, when we alerted the industry that hey the Chardonnay has gone from negative 18 to negative four in a matter of two weeks. And this is representative of this of this information here. And so these the, the, the varieties can differ with respect to this. I'm just looking at Chardonnay here because I don't want to overwhelm you with dots. Um, but it, you can see that the differences of the vintages can make, uh, or the or the dormant periods can make a big difference with respect to the amount of hardiness that's being gained or lost. And this is also evident here. Again, look at this cold winter of 2014-15, and we see that the, the there's the the changes in transition from dormancy to bud break are very, very slow. We're not getting very much, very much change at all. But then all of a sudden, we get late April, and all of a sudden it warms up, boom, really fast loss of hardiness because the temperatures went from winter to, well, it went from winter to summer, basically. And so the vines have uh, transitioned. Uh, they're ready to start growing for the growing season, and they are just gonna move very, very quickly. And this is something that we found through our research over the years is that the later uh, you are in dormancy, the more susceptible the vines will be to lose hardiness. And the more that they've lost previously can impact how quickly they're gonna lose it as well. And you see this a bit in 2015, 16, where they were losing hardiness quite um, uh, from, from February into March. And then it just gets quicker and quicker as we, as we move along and as we're getting warmer temperatures. So this is a very interesting area of research, particularly the deacclimation period. And this is a, definitely an area uh, where a lot of our research is focused in our lab group based on what we've learned from Final Alert and based on all of these data. Um, and so we have learned that cultivar site and season can impact the rates of acclimation uh, and particularly, or sorry, yeah, and also deacclimation. Acclimation rates are highly impacted by the growing season factors. The, 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 the three biggest things that I can conclude based on what we've looked at over the years is one, weather, and that can include everything from drought periods or really rainy periods, particularly during ac the acclimation period. Crop levels and fruit maturation can also play a big role, and Kevin's done a lot of work looking at some of that aspect in terms of how overall yields of, the, of that season can impact the hardiness. Uh, and so we do find that there's some of our yields, years that we have higher like, yields. These are like some just natural yield, yield variations that we can have in a, in a cool climate region like, uh, like Ontario. Uh, it, can, it can have an impact, right? And, and it's because of this balance in, in, in looking at fruit maturation. And then overall vine health can play a role as well, and particularly previous winter damage. So unfortunately, I think this is something that did play a role in British Columbia. Uh, this past year, as they have back-to-back -back years of a bad winter. So those vines, the vines that did survive two years ago or two winters ago, were compromised likely going into this one. And you get negative 25 temperatures, you know, even if the vines are healthy, they're gonna, they're gonna suffer. And we've had that experience before I even started here uh, at Covey, but I was working in the industry in 20, 2003 and 2004. Uh, we had, we had, or sorry, it was like 2003, 2002, 2003, and 2004, 2005, I think, were the years that we got whacked back to back, and we just saw, you know, vine decline because of that. Genetics are going to play the biggest role with maximum hardiness, but temperature can have an impact on this, as I, as I showed you in some, in some of the slides. And the crop level and the maturity can also limit that tolerance of that vine. And so certain varieties like Pinot Noir could be susceptible to crop levels. And if, again, if it's a really bad vintage and the fruit is not maturing well, the maximum hardness can also be impacted, right? It comes down to carbohydrate partitioning and if the vine's not getting enough energy to get through the winter, it's not going to acclimate and, and not going to be as strong as it could possibly be. And then deacclimation is highly driven by the, by the genotype as well as the temperature and in, in, uh, in winter conditions, you know, what happened before uh, it started to really warm up. And sites can play a larger role in some years as well. Uh, and that's where the lakes can come into play if they're very, very cold and, uh, and site can also play 
Uh, so proximity to, to the lake, as well as um, soils can also make a difference, but check how much water they're holding. Because if the roots are very cold and there's a lot of water in the ground, uh, the vines will be slower to, to come out of dormancy as well. So what are some of these implications, right? And this is something that I think about all the time now. Over, over the years and after showing you some of the data and looking at you know 500 different uh, data points that are that are uh, that we're looking at for a single variety a single site you know what are some of the conclusions now uh, and what are some of the considerations and if you look at some of these uh, some of the years of, of data that we have you know the, the ground has been very cold and traditionally this is what we would have be frozen ground snow, frozen lakes, and the vines would stay hardy. They, they would get hardy and they would maintain their dormancy. And unfortunately, now we're getting a lot more periods of warm winters with greater periods of volatility. I mean, um, I, I mentioned this in a talk, at, I don't know, one of my first coffee lecture series, probably not, no, maybe not one of my first, but after the, polar vor the first polar vortex event, and I was doing some you know, research on, on it, and I'm like, you know what, this is gonna become more common. And I think some people thought I was a bit mad, but you know we're seeing this now where the vortex comes down and it brings huge temperature differences in one year. And this year is an example with that volatility and the changes in the jet streams and so on. And so many people are cons are, are worried about about uh, drought and 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 heat during the growing season, which they should. I mean, particularly if you're thinking about BC, but BC has has not had these these cold winters until recently. Um, they, they've had them historically, but now they're coming back again. And so these warm winters are terrifying in a way because the vines may not maintain their hardiness. It increases the risk of freeze injury later in the winter. So you might not get the freeze events in the super, super cold in January, but now you're getting the events happening uh, in February, March, and April. And there could be greater consequences if it's combined with these other issues, such as having heat or drought stress during the growing season, excessive rain during maturation, and something that's very, very important here in Ontario, Canada, and the world, and why we have such a focus on it here at Covey, is plant status. The health status of the vine can also play a big role with respect to things like virus. And so when you look at this as a whole, you know, we need to find ways to create more resiliency in, in, uh, in grape growing. And I want to just um, talk a little bit about, you know, summarizing this as a, with respect to the benefits of when you have a whole cold harness monitoring program. You know, the benefits are, are extremely plentiful. Um, you know, you can look at this, and maybe some growers looked at this as just a service, right? And we and 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 we had tremendous success with development of these freeze mitigation strategies. We helped protect the crop. We saved the uh, grape and wine industry, the sector, a lot of losses. And at the same time, we've understood a lot about how grape vines respond to different growing season, winters, how different cultural practices can have an impact understanding this was a, uh, over the years, understanding more about freeze injury, how and when it occurs. And, you know, British Columbia are, are asking us now, you know, what do you guys do when this happened, right? How do you get the vines back? Because we've gone through this and we have the expertise and we have the knowledge. And a lot of this is not just having a random, uh, randomized complete block design experiment, but just going out in the field and, and, and looking at what happened at this vineyard versus this vineyard this clone versus that clone, and gaining that knowledge firsthand, and then using that to, to create new research. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about next. But learning about when damage can occur, how it can occur, and how different it can be from one site to the next, I think is huge. And, and I think the growers have learned a lot too about how to, how to mitigate this and what and what not to do. And then obviously learning more about freeze mitigation practices and how to optimize their, their use, uh, whether it's wind machines and all the wind machine work that started before I even started here, uh, and then work looking at geotextiles and so on, which is still happening uh, here in Ontario with growers as well as uh, in other regions like Quebec. 
And so if you look at vinyl alert itself, and just going to those points I made, this goes back to an economic analysis back in 2014 and, the, and all of the savings, both saving crop and direct savings from crop loss of, of uh, about $14 million in the first year and then $12 million roughly in subsequent years, uh, reduced wind machine usage, that's gotten way higher than $2 million now with the cost of fuel, and also saving the growers from renewing and replacing vines, which are also getting more expensive because we want and demanding clean uh, plants and also helping with different uh, uh, neighbor relations and farmer relations and community and government uh, uh, engagement and education uh, through this program. I love this slide. I'm gonna probably anger some people, but. <laughs> This shows you the, the, the great tonnage and sales to the great growers of uh, Ontario annual reports. And this, was, this part was from the economic analysis uh, that was done by the Goodman School of Business in 2014. And so you could see how variable the crop uh, size could be in the region. Uh, and this is, these were the years I was talking about earlier, 20, 20, 2003 and 2005, where we had uh, significant crop loss. And when you have back-to-back -back years, it's very, very devastating because there's no wine. The, the, the supplies start to diminish and you don't have the sales, you don't have the revenue coming from the farm or the winery. This is when pioneers like uh, Paul Boss Sr. started wind machines like and in, in, in implementing wind machines. And then the industry took off. Uh, there was support from the province to, um, to purchase these wind machines. And then we introduced vinyl or about a few years later. Uh, there was wind machine research done with Kevin and Helen uh, Fisher and Hugh Fraser uh, from Omafra, and they were looking at how to uh, use wind machines uh, the best way possible uh, and looking at best practices there. And then we introduced vinyl or. And look how this crop overall increased and kind of stabilized a bit more after we introduced those two technologies, both the monitoring program and, uh, and wind machines. In the years that this, these, these, these uh, crops, uh, the, 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 the crop production or the grape production decreased, this was the, these were the coldest winters we had probably almost ever experienced way, way colder than these winters. When I, when I, and I showed this in a previous Covey lecture. This was a much colder year than this year, but since we had mitigation strategies and knowing how hard those vines were, we, we helped protect that vintage. And, and, we, we, and we had much better yields and tonnage. This year, vinyl program didn't run, and we had significant wind, winter injury, and it was the lowest level since Vinyl alert was introduced. So I think it's, I don't know, you could call it correlation, and correlation isn't causation, but uh, I think it does say something in terms of uh, not having that, the program. And, and that was a year where we had record amounts of rain. We had a drought period prior to um, uh, fruit maturation. And as another outreach program that Covey has, we do the pre-harvest monitoring program. And, and, and we noticed, and you can look back, anyone can look back at the data, and you'll see that the sugar has really started to stall. Uh, and we weren't getting the sugar accumulation. To me, as a vine physiologist, I'm like, that's bad news. That means the vines are not, they're not, they're not uh, being productive. And when they're not productive, that fruit is not maturing, the vine's not maturing. So they were going into the winter in poor, un, under poor conditions. And even though it wasn't the coldest winter we had by any means, this winter here was much, much colder. Uh, th these vines suffered and we had significant winter injury and significant crop loss. So, you know, that is, and it was funny because I was talking to colleagues in other regions who also had monitoring programs. And uh, we, we were like, this is what happens if we, as soon as you cut the program, <laughs> things, things bad, <laughs> bad things happen. Anyways. But uh, it is, it is uh, a really important thing to have because you need to know, just like you need to know the status of your vines for virus, you, that information is so valuable in terms of managing your, your, your crop and, and, and managing your farm.
And this is just an example. I mean, again, I'm, I'm kind of telling and showing you slides from previous Covey lectures just to show you in a nutshell what we've done and then how this has also helped to examine when cold energy occurs, uh, learning more about duration of cold and how that can impact the vines and so on. A lot of our work looked at cultural practices, how growing seasons can impact vines, and this is just a shot of Merlot vines that were had a lighter crop on them and had an early harvest versus what I was talking about um, uh, just earlier with the, another vintage where we had a uh, uh, delay in fruit maturity, delayed harvest with a bigger crop. And you can see these vines have, have not gotten through the winter as well as these ones right beside them. Um, these vines are suckering from below. These ones have less suckers and these have a lot more primary growth compared to the ones on the right. And then freeze mitigation strategies and implications. So this is why we just created the, the monitoring program was to support all of those growers with wind machines that were using uh, other types of uh, mitigation strategies uh, that, and, and, ha and having to understand how the vines are responding to the various winters and what were the critical temperatures. Uh, and now, you know, we're looking at, this is at one of our research vineyards with a wind machine and we have it all automated even. So we can look at what the hardiness data that we're collecting in our lab and set the wind machines to the right temperature and they fire up when they need, when they need to. And also through our experience in looking at uh, other varieties, we, Marquette is now a VQA approved uh, hybrid variety, one of the first hybrid varieties that has been approved by VQA in a long time. And it has a lot of uh, Vitus riparia in its background, which gives it great winter hardiness in a really cold year, as you can see in, in, in this particular case or in these years where we had uh, very cold winters. But they will deacclimate a lot quicker and will not get the same level of hardiness in a warmer year. So very uh, problematic in, in situations where you are have a, have a, a um, continental climate, which can get very cold, but can warm up quickly. And so it can be more susceptible to, to frost, particularly in the later part of the season. We've looked at a lot of different uh, VQA approved varieties and vinifera varieties, everything from uh, Malbec to Tempranillo and everything kind of in between. Um, and so it is kind of interesting when you look at these different viniferas and how they will respond. And now we're looking at new alternative varieties, uh, such as uh, some of the Italian varieties that have come out of Udine and are offered um, through VCR and Nova vines right now. And in Budwood is now at uh, CGCN, uh, looking at some of these more disease resistant uh, cultivars that are vinifera based. And here's an example of one that we've been testing hardiness of this past winter, uh, Merlot Canthus. Uh, and there's a number of other ones that we're looking at as well. So this is part of the future, and Debbie had mentioned this in the introduction. This is just one of the examples of one of the varieties we're gonna be looking at and looking at it from a vine to glass approach. And I'll talk about that a bit at the end. Clones, we've noticed clonal difference uh, in the vineyards based on winter injury. And so here's an example of clones can make a difference. I'm gonna keep moving along because I'm gonna finish this off with some final points. Root stocks, we've learned a lot about root stocks over the years continuing to look at these as an adaptation strategy uh, and how different rootstocks can impact the hardiness of the vine. Uh, and also there can be some clone and, and, uh, and rootstock interactions as well, which are important, which I think is an area where uh, we need to understand more about uh, moving forward. And so if we're looking at building resiliency in cool climate viticulture, I know my colleagues on the analogy side are looking at uh, improving sustainability in winemaking, uh, and my colleagues in virology and entomology here at Covey are also looking at improving resiliency in vines and improving the, the quality and sustainability on the plant health side of things. And when you're looking at something like climate change and you have these, it's a complex challenge, it's not one simple solution. So it is looking at and learning from all that information that I presented today, and it's just a snapshot. I, I could talk about this all day, all week. You know, plant material and matching clean vines uh, with the proper clone, uh, the cultivar, and the rootstock is critical. And not every site, as you saw there, you know, especially when we're talking about some of these tender varieties, are gonna, are gonna be right for every site. And so it's not gonna be the same fit. 
And so we're gonna to have to need more tools in the toolbox as well with respect to vineyard management practices, with respect to freeze mitigation strategies, and we're also doing some work looking at even plant growth regulators to try to uh, improve the resiliency of, of vines. And that's what you're seeing here. This isn't winter injury, but the late bud break uh, because it had a plant growth regulator um, such as a cysic acid analog applied to it and we were able to delay the acclimation and bud break. So in the past 13 years of all of this work, it's going to pave, help us pave the way for the future. We have learned a lot about this complex trait of hardiness. We've learned how these different genotypes respond to different environmental conditions, and it's helped us advance our basic understanding of cold hardiness and also to help develop better practices to mitigate freeze injury. Cultivar clone rootstock evaluations have been, ex have been established because of these uh, observations and, and information that we have gained through all of this work. And we're planning to continue and expand all of this. We've looked at new cold hardiness promoters, such as the uh, Epsizic an analogs, and we're looking at how we can help reduce early deacclimation. And we have some additional funding through the SCAP program in terms and in, in, in working with colleagues here at Brock as well as Vineland Research Innovation Center uh, so in terms of selection of more superior grapevine material for cold resilience. And I want to finish off with this because this is going to be the future. So the future of Covey and Brock is the Clean Agriculture for Sustainable Production Field Infrastructure, or CASP. And so this is the uh, uh, overhead view of this program. So Dr. Pujari and myself are leads on this project with team members uh, from everybody on Covey, as well as uh, uh, fellows and, or sorry, colleagues in uh, biology and engineering, as well as at UBC and in Quebec at, at research institutes there. And so this is going to be a, a farm-based research center where we're gonna continue and this is just talking about the work that right here today and continuing that research, but it's gonna be so much more than that. It's a roughly 9.9 .9 million uh, investment from the Canada Foundation for Innovation, uh, Ontario Research Fund and Brock University. And here just a rendering of what it may look like here with respect to research building, uh, greenhouse and screen houses, as well as a research vineyard. So if we look at the core of this program, it is this, uh, the CAS program has three main components. And the first one is where everything starts. It's the clean plant program led by Sid. And this program has been, again, a work in progress at Covey and it's now going to expand and it's going to help drive the industry forward and improve the sustainability of the industry. It's going uh, through a clean plant program. We are going to have clean vines and clean uh, uh, material available. That's gonna be uh, supplied from a domestic source and not relying on imports. So this is going to help our, our, uh, our security with respect to uh, agriculture and food security when it comes to uh, vines. With the clean plant program, like I said, it all starts from there. And we're going to expand our work that we're doing, looking at some of these, looking at hardiness uh, and looking at the impacts of climate on, on vines. This is going to be done through work in a vineyard, uh, a research vineyard that's going to be on site. So we're going to expand our cultivar evaluations. We're going to look at different clone and rootstock combinations, ones that growers shouldn't be taking risks with. We can take that risk now with this farm. And this is not just, this is taking that information that, we, that I've been talking about over the last 14 years and moving forward. And hopefully at an accelerated pace as well because of the, the nature of having the clean plant program right there and we're able to get access to this material and have access to the farm where we're able to take that risk and, and look at these, because some of them are gonna be failures, right? Our others are going to be really great success stories. Hopefully we can have uh, clean, uh, Canadian clones, Canadian cultivars and that type of thing based on selections. And looking at improving efficiency in, in vineyard production, looking at e ecological interactions uh, and also urban applications. So I, there's so much more than what I can talk about right now in the interest of time, but I do want to put this out there 
and and because it's very very exciting for us for Brock and it is the future for everything that I've talked about today in terms of what we're going to be doing moving forward and it's going to be really really exciting I think and so but it all started with the monitoring program and in the vinyl alert program that's where it all began and and now Covey has expanded with all of the additional scientists and so it's just me and, and one other. And so it's, it's, it's uh, a really exciting time for, for us in the industry uh, moving forward. So I'll leave it at that and you'll hear a lot more about this from myself and all my colleagues who'll be presenting in future years. And again, thank you for having me this year and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Did they what to the land? I, in some cases, I, I think that did happen because of just vine availability. That's always been a problem, um, but it's not necessarily a normal practice. If the if the grower can get uh, vines, they'll try to get them planted right away. But it does take time, and when there's a lot of vine replacement needed in one year, there can be shortages on what you what you want. No, I don't think so. I have a question, Jim. Um, yep. When you were talking about uh, you know warmer warmer winters, um, you know ground warming up mm -hmm. earlier in the spring, and you know helping like reducing the rate of deacclimation, which is critical for us because of spring frost and everything else, we still have to worry about. Is that also something you know we need to be talking to growers about for not working the land too early in the spring when we do have a dry March, let's say things warm up and growers want to get in there and get ahead of the game, but is that something we shouldn't be doing? Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, that, that's probably something that shouldn't be done because you will you when you work the ground you'll you'll warm it up and it'll and a lot of your roots are in the you know the upper surface of the of uh, the soil, so you, yeah, that can be a, a, a consequence if you would work the ground because making the vines deacclimate yeah. much faster. Yeah, and that's something we haven't actually looked at. It's an area of research that we're looking at moving forward uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Let Vasseur is looking at cover crops. Mm -hmm. So it might be an implication of cover crops, and that's going to be part of the farm work too, and seeing how that may uh, having a permanent sod may impact uh, acclimation or cold act or cold deacclimation as well. That's a really good. That's a really good point. I think just with our changing climate, you know, wet uh, um, growers, I know, always just want to get in there and get the yeah. season starts coming up fast, and I think maybe we just have to hold back a little bit more than what normally we would be, you know, if if. The changing climate continues. Yeah, that is, that's an excellent point. And and even pruning, um, delayed pruning can delay um, bud break. So we typically prune, as you know, the hardiness, the the, the hardiest uh, vines first, and the least hardy last. Um, but yeah, even delaying that. But again, it's it's workforce and labor that's, that comes into play too in that balancing act. But yeah, growers definitely want to get ahead in the spring because everything happens at once, especially when you go from winter to summer. Yeah, yeah, without a spring. Without a spring. I think there's been some interest in using this large data set for like monitoring systems. And as you were talking, I was wondering if our constantly changing climate might be too difficult to predict with monitoring systems. Like, has that been applied yet, or is that? Being yeah, that's an excellent question. So the question was, you know, if we're having these huge variability in our, in our winter weather and our growing seasons, you know, how can modeling, is there risk to modeling basically, is that what you're kind of asking? Yeah, for sure, I, and I think even, I, I don't think you can 100% rely on modeling data um, for that reason, um, and that's why, again, a monitoring program and getting that hard data 
is, is important for me, I think, in terms of uh, if I was a grower, if I'm a researcher, I wouldn't want to just use, I want to get the data right from the, right from the source, right from the freezer and the, and the, and the lab equipment. Because if you go back, I don't want to take too much time, but I mean, if you go back, the models are going to be looking at the best fit, right? And then you've got these anomalies. I mean, this is a huge outlier here, but I mean, you, you have to be mindful of all that, right? And depending on your region and, and on a region where we have a lot of variability uh, in our sites, that's what makes Niagara and Ontario and BC everywhere really, really cool is we have a lot of diversity in our terroir. You can say that it's going to probably impact the hardiness too. And then especially if there's a wide range of clones and rootstocks, that is to take into consideration as well. So yeah, and that's, yeah, that's, that's what makes it complicated. And last question? Yeah, are you going to grow up root rootstocks at the teaching Pardon me? Are you going to grow up rootstocks? Yeah, yeah, there's going to be a number of different rootstocks. Uh, we want to bring in some new rootstocks that, uh, might be used for adaptation strategies moving forward. Maybe not the best selection right at this moment, but down the road. Again, if we're seeing certain trends uh, in terms of uh, more drought or so on, we might have to switch some of the rootstocks that we're currently using that are more susceptible to drought. So we want to have, again, tools in our toolbox and have them available to the industry when needed. Jim, thank you so much. Thanks for so such a, uh, a great talk today. Uh, <laughs> and that actually wraps it up for us for the 2024 lecture uh, series. I hope you enjoyed the, the series this year. It's all in support of our 5.5 billion uh, industry here in Ontario and the 11 and a half billion industry across all of Canada. So hope to see you here next year. We'll have to let you know the time um, uh, for next year uh, as we get a little bit closer to that in 2025. Wow. <laughs> anyway, take care.